Hello and welcome to the Book Club Review. I'm Kate and this is the podcast about book clubs and the books that get people talking. Indian-born writer Salman Rushdie has had a turbulent career. After his book, Midnight's Children, won the 1981 Booker Prize, he had the literary world at his feet. Circumstances changed dramatically, however, in 1988, following publication of Rushdie's book, The Satanic Verses. The book fictionalised parts of the life of the Prophet Muhammad, with depictions that some Muslims considered blasphemous. In 1989, the Ayatollah Khomeini, The supreme leader of Iran issued a fatwa ordering Muslims to kill Salman Rushdie and putting a price on his head of several million dollars. After that, Rushdie was forced to live his life in hiding. 30 years later, in 2022, appearing at the Chautauqua Festival in upstate New York, the 76-year-old Rushdie was attacked and stabbed multiple times. He survived but faces a long recovery and has lost the sight of one eye. His most recent novel, Victory City was published in February of this year to much critical acclaim, but as ever here at the Book Club Review, we're interested in what Laura's book club made of it. Unfortunately, this is a Laura-less episode as she couldn't make our recording, but she has deputized our friend and podcast regular journalist Philip Chafee to report back, along with first-time guest, avid reader and keen book clubber Charlie Chichester. Listen in for our full and frank discussion, plus our recommendations for follow-on reads. That's all coming up here on the Book Club Review. Phil, it's so nice to have you as ever. How are things in New York? Pretty good. Beautiful weather. Life is good. Did you watch the coronation? No. (laughs) It was very early. (laughs) They didn't have it playing in Times Square or anything like that? I'm sure there was playing somewhere. My aunt got up very early on the West Coast to watch it. I do have a British citizenship now, so I guess I'm a bad citizen, but I did not wake up early to watch it. Did you watch? I did, actually. I thought I was going to switch it on and have it going in the background, but I found it absolutely mesmerizing. It was really good. We've just got so good at all this pageantry stuff recently. And Charlie, so lovely to have you joining us. Over the years, I feel like your opinions have been referenced several times on the podcast, but we've never actually had you in person. So it's very nice to have you here. Nothing too controversial, I hope. It's my pleasure to be here at last. I always describe Phil when I'm introducing him in this very reductive way as journalist Phil Chafee. Do you have a massively simplified reduction of what you do in this life, apart from reading? (laughs) Yes, Pooterish civil servant. Let's run with that. (laughs) Okay, well, welcome. And let's turn to Victory City. I have a feeling it might be thanks to me that you ended up reading this one for book club. That sounds right. I think, Laura, we were sort of humming and hawing about what our next book was going to be. You had already been raving about this and you had read it and Laura pitched it and we all said, yeah. I read it in advance of publication because I was sent a proof by Vintage. Before we get to then our opinions on it, let's review what the book is about. Victory City is described by the publishers as the epic tale of a woman who breathes a fantastical empire into existence, only to be consumed by it over the centuries. The book begins in the 14th century with a battle between two regional kingdoms. After one is defeated and the men all killed, the surviving women leave the city and gather around a bonfire where they collectively walk into the flames. The survivor is a little girl called Pampa Campana, who is nine years old. And at this point, I wanted to play a clip from the audiobook, published by Penguin Audio and narrated by Sid Segar. After the insignificant battle, surprisingly, there was an event of the kind that changes history. The story goes that the women of the tiny, defeated kingdom, most of them recently widowed as a result of the no-name battle, left the fourth-rate fortress after making final offerings at the fifth-rate temple, crossed the river in small boats, improbably defying the turbulence of the water, walked some distance to the west along the southern bank, and then lit a great bonfire and committed mass suicide in the flames. Gravely, without making any complaint, they said farewell to one another and walked forward without flinching. Nor were there any screams when their flesh caught fire and the stink of death filled the air. They burned in silence. Only the crackling of the fire itself could be heard. Bumpa Gumpana saw it all happen, 
It was as if the universe itself was sending her a message, saying, open your ears, breathe in, and learn. And then I just want to skip forward over the scene when the little girl watches her mother walk into the flames, to what happens next, when she becomes a vessel for the goddess Pavati, also known locally as Pampa. With a feeling of serene detachment, Pampa, the human being, began to listen to the words of Pampa, the goddess, coming out of her mouth. She had no more control over them than a member of the audience has over the monologue of the star, and her career as a prophet and miracle worker began. Physically, she didn't feel any different. There were no unpleasant side effects. She didn't tremble or feel faint or experience a hot flush or a cold sweat. She didn't froth at the mouth or fall down in an epileptic fit, as she had been led to believe could happen, and had happened to other people in such cases. If anything, there was a great calm surrounding her, like a soft cloak, reassuring her that the world was still a good place and things would work out well. From blood and fire, the goddess said, life and power will be born. In this exact place, a great city will rise, the wonder of the world, and its empire will last for more than two centuries. And you, the goddess addressed Pampa Kampana directly, giving the young girl the unique experience of being personally spoken to by a supernatural stranger speaking through her own mouth. You will fight to make sure that no more women are ever burned in this fashion, and that men start considering women in new ways and you will live just long enough to witness both your success and your failure, to see it all and tell its story, even though once you have finished telling it, you will die immediately, and nobody will remember you for 450 years. In this way, Pampa Kampana learned that a deity's bounty was always a two-edged sword. And from there the story takes off. Pampa Kampana does indeed found a city she calls Biznaga. She creates the inhabitants from nothing and she gives them stories and histories so they will be fully alive. She marries, she falls in love, she has children, her empire flourishes and everything is recorded in the story that she writes which is buried and unearthed four centuries later to be retold in Rushdie's book. And so, Phil, Charlie, I'm very curious to know how your book club got along with this book. What did you think of this character Pampa Campana? Phil, should we start with you? I was less concerned with the character, and maybe Rush was less concerned with the character than the broader civilization and city. I want to say by the end of the book, I had no real sense of who she was, but I was interested by it. Charlie, how about you? The book definitely takes the broad sweep of history as its main viewpoint, and the characters are almost sort of two-dimensional pieces within that broader setting, and that includes the main character, Pampa Kampana. I think she is the creator of the city, she's the creator of its inhabitants, and she is the city's own historian and a lead player in all of the events that take place. And yet somehow we're left feeling that we don't really know her by the end of the book. And I think that was a feeling that was echoed by the rest of the book club when we were trying to wrestle with this novel. And so if Pampa Campana isn't the main character, then who? Who is the character that does come through this novel? I would say it's the city itself. It's some of the rulers of the city. It's the visitors to the city. There are a series of dashing young Portuguese men, horse traders and general international men of mystery who show up and become Pampa Campana's lover. The city itself, though, is the main character of the book. The inhabitants of the city, even though we're told that Pampa Campana whispers stories into their ears and gives life to them and creates their very being, we don't really meet them. They are just background walk-on figures. It is the city that rises and falls and turns to ashes by the end of the novel. When I started reading it, I was enjoying it. I think you get that sense from the clip that we heard. It's written in this quite engaging, accessible, quite immediate style. And yet, 
you can't really get too invested in the characters because, as you say, there's not much to them. And you're held at a distance from the story by the fact that it's something that's being related to you, something that supposedly was written 400 years ago and has been found and is now being retold and you're reading it. So it doesn't have that immediacy of, of an immersive, character-driven, plot-driven novel in the normal sense. What I realised, just as I was starting to find that a bit frustrating, was that the main character was the story itself. Those are the last words of the book, aren't they? Words of the real victors. I'm probably paraphrasing. No, I think you're right. Words are the only victors. Yeah, Rushdie's main conclusion from the book is that language triumphs overall and language is what remains even after human flesh is withered or, in the case of Bumper's mother, burnt away. I was going to argue with Charlie's idea that the city is the main character because I actually, one of my criticisms was I walked away, I didn't have a lot of sense of the geography of the city, the color, the people. I just... <laughs> but it's a story, as you said, that is much more what this is. I don't know if there is really a character. The story is the point and narrative is the point. Like your initial question, her character, is just not a book about characters. <laughs> Remember there was a book where I wanted maps <laughs> and <laughs> diagrams and casts of characters and you know all the extra bits and bobs that can come with stories and novels this would be it the text alone feels not quite enough for me they weren't able to do a real life launch for this so they did a virtual launch for it with a talk between margaret atwood and neil gaiman discussing the book which i watched at the time Margaret Atwood, who I've never seen speak before, is the most extraordinary speaker because you have the sense that every single word that she uses, she really, really understands and knows what that word means. And so when you listen to her talk, you get this extraordinary sense of the power of words in a way that I just don't think I've had with anyone else. Anyway, that's just an aside about Margaret Atwood. She was talking about the idea of the narrator who introduced himself as the spinner of yarns. And she was talking about that idea of the text as being something that's woven. She goes on to talk about the fates and Scandinavian mythology and the idea of the threads of narrative. So for her, having the story framed by this device of this text, and for Neil Gaiman as well, talking about the idea of the power of stories and the way that stories are handed down and the power that stories have to teach us are all ideas that Rushdie is tapping into with this. Phil, what did you think? Yeah, absolutely. I think that was the most fascinating part of this, particularly the beginning and the end, <laughs> some of the middle where I, I've, I'm not sure he's really interacting with the idea of narrative and its impacts. But I mean, there's a lot in any Rush G book. There's so many threads and he's doing so much and he's referencing so many things that you can never reduce it to one theme. But yeah, I think what I most enjoyed about this book was what you are articulating. Neil Gaiman said, to him, the book wasn't magic realism or fantasy. It feels like an act of mythic creation and delight in story that's designed to make us think about what words are and to make us think about how stories last and last long after the heroes and villains are gone. He was saying that he felt that was really what was being celebrated. And then, of course, it feels incredibly appropriate thinking about the novel in the context of Rushdie's own life and experiences and free speech. And words having a power that perhaps we don't always acknowledge or think about. Words really matter. And Rushdie knows this more than anybody. I mean, Charlie, did that add an extra dimension to it for you? I think so. It's funny because the power that is ascribed to words, sometimes it's overdone by the people who are afraid of those words, i.e. despots and people in power. You can see that with the satanic verses and how the Ayatollahs reacted to this book that was actually fairly i've not read it but i've heard it's actually fairly innocuous but it landed rushdie with this fatwa and someone from special branch having to tail around with him for years and then you see that again in this book in this novel when there are protests and citizens are holding up blank pieces of paper which is an odd coincidence given the protests that took place in china last year where angry citizens were also holding up blank pieces of paper as a protest against censorship and it's almost undercutting the paranoia of the authorities and their fear of any words of dissent whatsoever. So that is a definite theme of this book. But what I find strange is that Victory City, Viznaga, is such a tolerant place, but it veers so wildly between that tolerance and that openness at some points, and then outright tyranny and despotism at other points, depending on which man, and it is always man, even when Pumper Company is acting as a regent, there's always a man who is king. 
and different kings rule in different ways. Because there is this quite interesting and to me quite surprising thread of feminism throughout the book, which I was not expecting. This sense that it was almost like the weakness of men constantly throughout and this idea of this female goddess character witnessing all this, interacting with it, sometimes influencing it, sometimes being the victim of it. I have to say, I really enjoyed all that for me as a woman. I liked it. It was good, I thought, given that I suppose, you know, because it's this idea that it plays closely enough to real history that we know about, although it was all so long ago, we don't know that much about it. But there are enough touches of real things and real events and that this then is almost like an alternate history or a possible history or what might have been or could have been. Perhaps looking back at it with more 21st century eyes, Phil, how did that almost like the slight wokeness of it land with you? I mean, the clip you read sets it up. A lot of the description set it up as sort of this feminist fable. I didn't fully see that in the novel. I guess all the leaders are dudes and they're all, <laughs> for the large part, pretty petty and bad. I can't really think of a man that comes out of it well, apart from possibly the, what did you call them, Charlie? The men of mystery, <laughs> the, the recurring figure, <laughs> of the handsome Portuguese adventurer who turns up in different centuries. But then some of the women come out pretty petty too, like some of her yes. daughters. I mean, <laughs> even the main character, I don't know, she doesn't come out super like this feminist icon. For me, there's a reason I wanted to pick up on that very... The bit I clipped out was the tail end of this extraordinary, to me, opening of this scene of these women walking into the fire. Mm -hmm. And that overshadows Pampa Campana's life. She never forgets it, ever. And you're reminded of it at points throughout the book. I thought the way he wrote that scene was absolutely extraordinary. It stayed with me. I think he writes it in a way that he wants it to stay with you. And I just found, I think, the wrongness of that and the horror of it, because we know that this is what happened, that women would be immolated on their husband's funeral pyres. This was a real thing. And his interest in that and weaving that in spoke quite strongly to me. I didn't forget it. I find the tone of that excerpt weird because it's almost flippant. The phrase in particular where the narrator goes, only when the last folds of flesh had burnt off the bone did Bamba Kampana realise her mother was gone for good. It's a very odd phrase. I think she would have realised long before that that her mm. mother had burnt to death. It's quite offhand way to describe Twati and something that is a real historical phenomenon that is quite troubling to me anyway as an idea. It was almost a little bit odd that he dealt with it so lightly. Yes. And then mm. that's and then mm. there's that moment of horror and then there is nothing like that throughout the rest of the novel. Tonally, mm. the rest of the novel is very rooted in traditional ideas of warfare and conflict and empire building and fantasy as well. But that's as real and as hardcore as the novel gets. In the Well, I would push back on that. There's two, we all know them, I don't want to spoil it, two key acts of violence at the end, which are also resonant with the attacks on Rushdie which are very powerful. Those really stuck with me. And weirdly, those really punched me in the gut. I thought that was suddenly for like feeling like I was watching two-dimensional stick figures. It did feel very resonant and very emotional even. Yeah, I agree. Absolutely. It's like bookended by these two things. I mean... I feel like you guys are both being quite polite about it. Oh, yeah. Phil, <laughs> well, both of you actually know because it was relayed to you by Laura, but also I think Phil was present when we recorded the conversation where I was talking about it and what I'd thought of it. So, you know, you know I was a fan. I got from Laura at one point that I think everyone was really lagging about reading it and getting into it. And I would be the first to admit for the first third it is quite put downable because there's no strong thread pulling you through. You don't really get invested in any of the characters because you are held at this remove by this device of a story within a story and there's nothing to really grip you. I just found the more I read, the more I wanted to read and this idea of the story being the thing that I'd slightly fallen in love with for me was the thing that then ended up being the hook for me and the thing that carried me through it. And it, it wasn't relevant to me what happened. I didn't care about what happened because the joy was in experiencing this story being told. Now, I hadn't expected that to happen. You know, I was as surprised as anybody <laughs> that it did. That was my experience. But it sounds, I feel like perhaps that wasn't the case for the book club. Yeah, I think it was 
basically broke the book club. I mean, no. <laughs> basically a week before <laughs> we were going to talk about it, almost everyone, I had not sorted yet because I wanted to read it just in the days before, but basically everyone else was like, yeah, I picked it up, put it back down. Like, can't, can't do it. Charlie, you started and stopped, right? I started and stopped. That's partly because I went on holiday. But then when I came back, I was still off work. So actually, that was good because I mean, I could sit down and really concentrate hard on it. Mm. Because I don't think it was the kind of book I would have been able to fit in before going to bed every night after a long day at work. Yeah. Yeah. The book club, there was a bit of fatigue with this one. We did all struggle a little bit to finish it. We all struggled to discuss it as well because there are plenty of themes to discuss. But in terms of, drama and conflict and character arcs there's not much discernible in those departments and there's therefore not a lot for people to disagree about which is often where I find the best book club conversations come from. I think that's such a good point because earlier on when I was writing the script I was trying to think about what the talking points would be and I found myself struggling to write anything down and I nearly texted you Charlie to say what would you say were the main things that you guys discussed and I thought no that's ridiculous you know it will come out in the conversation it will be fine <laughs> so that's actually really interesting I mean I also we did the book club and then I was like I'm never gonna pick up this book again so <laughs> oh dear I just didn't see myself rereading it and it's very long and there's no clear plot the characters are often quite two-dimensional a lot of it just went clean out of my head and then I received the call, that, you know, would you like to come on and discuss this on the podcast? I thought, okay, what am I going to do? <laughs> Thankfully, the BBC came to the rescue and I listened to the adaptation that they've made for the book at bedtime. And they, oh, the BBC must have liked it, or at least they must like Salman Rushdie because they put it on as the book at bedtime, not for one week like most books get. They did it for two weeks. So there's 10 episodes, each 15 minutes long. So it works out as uh, like two and a half hours as like an abridged version of the book. I listened to that all through today as kind of crib notes and I quite enjoyed it and everything made much more sense when it's all quite <laughs> condensed and you can see the structure of the book much more clearly. I feel like we're getting this is good tips you know book club is out there if you're struggling with your book club check on Radio 4 find out if they did it <laughs> on book at bedtime. <laughs> but it's so hypocritical because I was just gently ribbing a friend of mine this weekend because he told me he was listening to Moby Dick and I said, oh, one of the best, you know, opening pages in literature. And he said, oh, I don't know. I'm listening to the abridged, <laughs> dramatized version. <laughs> and I, you know, I was very snobbish and what have you. And now here I am extolling the virtues of a dramatized, abridged version of another novel. But it helped me prepare for this podcast, I must say. Yes. And you feel like I'm sure the BBC, when they do that task of getting things into a form that works for Book at Bedtime, think about it incredibly carefully. Phil. I feel like you have a point to make. Yeah, yeah. I was just going to say, when we discussed it, I think multiple people made this point that it's very on the scales of magical realism. It's got a lot of it. And I think that may have limited the general appetite of the group. And I think Francis made the point that <laughs> the rules of this particular magical realist world are sort of changing every page. So the stakes seem very low and combine that with the two-dimensional character. And it's very hard to care about it, which is why those acts of the violence took me by surprise that I did care at that point. Because for so much of it, that's what was hard to pick it up every day. What are the rules here? What are the stakes? It just felt very amorphous and could go in any direction. And sometimes those flights were fun, but sometimes those flights were tedious. Interesting. I think, Phil, surely you would go along with me here that 331 pages is not a long book. Charlie. Yeah, I wouldn't call it a long book. It felt like come, a long come. book, though. I, <laughs> I can get that. <laughs> I also would say I found it absolutely virtuosic, the writing, the use of language, the sense of control and mastery that you would sort of expect, I think, a writer of this caliber at this stage in his career. I hadn't read other Rushdie, though. I'd read Midnight's Children back in the day, but so many years ago, I don't remember it. I read The Moor's Last Sigh, which I don't remember enjoying that much. And I haven't read anything by him since. But Phil, you've read more Rushdie, I think, haven't you? How does this hold up? I've read Midnight's Children and I've read Satanic Verses, both of those when I was in university. And I absolutely love Satanic Verses. Both of those are comparable on the scale of magical realism. But Satanic Verses... I just thought was bursting with these ideas and this energy and very punchy thematic energy, which I didn't quite feel with this one. Also, I read this some time ago, 
And much like Charlie, I was slightly uh, desperately <laughs> trying to <laughs> remember, you know, what I'd thought about it when it came to the show. And I was flipping through it and really wishing like, oh, wish I really left the time to reread this because I suspect it's one of those books that actually is quite rewarding on a second reading. But it's true, I hadn't retained that much from it. What really stayed with me and what I won't forget is how I felt when I read it and what it meant to me when I read it. I really felt he was trying to send a message about writing and about words. And I think there's a reason that generally authors absolutely revere him because I think he stands for something that feels incredibly important. And I'm very glad this book exists. Let me turn before we go to the final question of whether it was a good book club book. Just quickly to the online reviews, which I love to check in with. Indra Datta gave it five out of five stars, saying another masterpiece from a master storyteller. She said, I've just completed reading Salman Rushdie's latest historical fiction, Victory City. The title is a literal translation of the name of the old southern Indian empire of Vijayanagara, amusingly corrupted in the novel as Bisnaga, as was apparently also done by the Portuguese traveller Domingo Pace, who visited this empire and wrote a glowing memoir about it. Coincidentally, I recently reread two of his earlier masterpieces, The Satanic Verses and Midnight's Children, after an interval of many years. All are beautiful examples of the great art of magical realism. However, this one felt quite different, written by a much older, mellower master storyteller, after a life's worth of experience and wisdom, though still with his unique sense of pun and humour. Here again he has spun a yarn in a historical fashion, mostly allegorical, though heavily based on real historical places and events. I am not a historian, nor a professional book reviewer, so my comments only go as far as I can interpret. I feel this nearly two and a half century long saga continues his solo battle against bigotry, religious fanaticism, sexism and ignorance of all kinds, and for tolerance towards our differences and diversity. He himself has suffered much from that fanaticism and ignorance, nearly losing his own life recently to it. It's also a warning against the rise of intolerant, fanatical versions of religion worldwide, particularly in the country of his and my birth, warning us that nothing good can come out of it. Sometimes it feels he has become rather cynical about human nature and its atavistic tendency to revert to its destructive and vengeful baser instincts. Nonetheless, his optimism and hope continues to shine through. Like his predecessor, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, Rushdie is a master practitioner of magical realism, moving with supreme ease between the worlds of reality and fantasy. This book is a wonderful example of that. I only hope someday rather soon they will bestow on him the Nobel Prize for Literature before it becomes too late. Did and... Salman Rushdie write that? <laughs> Indra Datta. <sighs> she is not alone. Joel gave it five stars, saying, The usual Rushdie brilliance. This is my fourth Rushdie magical realism book, after Verses, Midnight's Children, and Quichotte. He never fails to successfully create an alternative reality filled with fascinating, sometimes magical, and sometimes mundane characters that interact in wholly unpredictable ways. If you want a formulaic take, this isn't it. To savour Rushdie is to know the impossibility of life as it's lived in any age. It's ridiculous, unpredictable, potent, overwhelming and silly. It will hit you hard in the face and drag you down, but there's also a precious and loving piece of it all that he never forgets. In my view, he's better at his best than Pinchon, Garcia Marquez or Bulgakov, although I love them as well. So some fans out there, but also some people who weren't so impressed. L. Young gave it two stars, a historical fantasy that loses its way. I have been a fan of Salman Rushdie for many years, considering him the finest writer in the English language today. His last novel, Kichot, was a disappointment to me. However, I had high hopes for Victory City and his return to writing about India. His new novel begins in a promising way with its recreation by magic seas of the fortified city of Hampi, the capital of the Vijayanagara Empire that ruled southern India. Hampi is quite real and its magnificent ruins can be visited today. It was a prosperous city that flourished for 150 years before being destroyed by the Muslim sultanates. In Victory City, Hampi is named Bisnaga. What could have been a fascinating look at this ancient civilization is sadly undone by Rushdie's accretion of fantasies, magic realism and contemporary wokeism, where a woman lives 247 years without aging while watching her loved ones age and die. Women are warriors as fierce as men. Some can fly, some can run up walls at dazzling speed. The story quickly bogs down into an endless word salad, literary page padding and utter boredom. A bit of historical fantasy is fine, but here Rushdie and the reader drowns in its successes, 
so sad because it had such potential. Yes, I'd forgotten about the women warriors and the sword fighting, which was all a bit crouching tiger, hidden dragon, I thought. Yeah, I found it interesting that there was, was it, Pampa Kampana sends for someone from China to come to her realm. And that person is a grandmaster of martial arts, which I feel like medieval China was a cutting edge civilization that arguably had more to offer beyond just sword fighting, you know, crouching tiger, hidden dragon, Jackie Chan, etc. Also, Alan gave it three out of five stars. He said, if you like fables with what seems like five new characters introduced on each page, then this is the book for you. Not really my thing, but the story underneath is an interesting one and the lessons of power and war and meaning come through. I felt like stopping numerous times and listening to the audible narration was not all that great because of the proliferation of characters, many with very long and similar names. I'd like to understand more about how Rushdie conceived of all of this, but I'm not feeling compelled to read another of his books. And finally, over on Goodreads, Steve gave it two stars and said, From what seemed to be a great premise, this was ultimately disappointing. The meandering nature of the tale, which should have been filled with highs and lows, remains flat throughout. The main character, pitched as a driving force over a 250-year period, seems to have little or no agency and is swept along by history rather than being interwoven into it. Elements of what could have been better are passed over by the fictional translator, writer, who chooses to allude to greatness rather than putting it on the page. Coupled with the uncomfortable misogyny that seeps into the story, which could have been highlighted as such but isn't, leaves a bad taste in the mouth, almost as if it's acceptable. The whole story seems like a badly worded fable with very little to learn from. It gets a solid meh from me. So there is one final question we must ask ourselves, and that is, did it make for a good book club book? Phil, Charlie. <laughs> I would say we struggled a bit. I think if you had been there, Kate, or if we'd had some stronger opinions, we sort of went from tepid to lukewarm, I would say. I don't think anyone despised the book, and I don't think anyone loved the book. Does that sound right, Charlie? <laughs> yeah, I think there was general air of fatigue and people being lost for words. We struggled to find anything meaningful and meaty to discuss. Going back to what one of the reviewers said about it being an allegory, I would really agree with that. I feel like with this book, you're encountering Rushdie, the moralizer, the philosopher, the public intellectual, rather than necessarily Rushdie, the storyteller. Even though it is a book about stories, it doesn't have a clear plot, per se, or as I said earlier, a clear character arc. I think that made it harder for us all to get to grips with the book and find areas of common ground. Oof. Well, listeners, you know yourself and you know your book club. If you think this is for you, I personally can't recommend it highly enough, but you will have to make your own judgment call on this one. Inspired by Victory City, here are some more recommendations for your next read. Charlie, what have you got for us? I'm going to recommend a book I read years ago now. I did quite enjoy Bordolino by Umberto Eco, which is in a similar vein to Victory City, a magical realist medieval epic which starts during the fall of Constantinople to murderous crusading knights and then ranges across medieval Europe in the 12th century and then goes in a weird digression as the hero, this medieval Italian peasant who speaks in tongues, he at the end of the novel goes off in search of the mythical kingdom of Prester John and meets all of these fabled, fabulous medieval beasts. It's very strange. It's very long. It's very meandering. But I think if you like Victory City, then you should definitely give this a try. Mm, I don't know. I'm not sure he's going to shoot to the top of my TBR. How about you, Phil? I was choosing between two. I'm going to go with the one that's not particularly magical realist, um, but similarly a fable about a medieval kingdom, which is Michael Shaban's Gentleman of the Road. This is much more a swashbuckling tale, much, much more plot. So it's not quite the same vibes, but it's about these two guys who wander into via various kidnappings and wandering around the road, the medieval Khazar kingdom, which was the slightly mythical, slightly not medieval Jewish kingdom in the Caucasus. And this one, there's just a lot more going on. It's very fun, but it tackles what could this amazing medieval kingdom that basically none of us have heard of have been like. It's also fast and it's a fun read. Mm, I love Michael Shaven. 
Okay, mine is a bit random, but Neil Gaiman made me think of it when he was talking about the book. Have you ever read the book version of The Princess Bride? I mean, not the book version. The film is a version of the book, The Princess Bride. <laughs> the original. Robin. Yeah, <laughs> the <talking>. original. <laughs> you have not. No, I haven't. So everybody knows the film. I'm sure I don't need to remind you. My name is Inigo Montoya. But the film is based on a book. I didn't know this, but my book club did it years ago. And yes, but like the one person out there who might not know it, it features giants, jewels, man-eating swamp rats, and of course, true love. Mythologized by the author as the good parts version of a magnificent book by the great Florinese writer S. Morgenstern, The Princess Bride is a gripping, tongue-in-cheek fairy tale. It tells the story of Buttercup, an exceptionally beautiful girl who rises from unlikely beginnings to receive the dubious hand in marriage of the barrel-like Prince Humperdinck. Meanwhile, her true love, Wesley, the farm boy, must cross perilous seas, climb the cliffs of insanity, fight off man-eating swamp rats, and survive the abominable zoo of death to rescue her from a grisly end. Fast-paced and funny, The Princess Bride lampoons the fairy tale tradition, but is at once a classic in its own right. It's a good read. What you wouldn't know, if you just know the film, is that there's this really weird second half where they all go off and live on an island somewhere and things get very strange indeed. It's a weird old ride, that book, but actually it was really fun to discuss in book clubs, so I, I do recommend it. And obviously it's got all the joy of, well, any film you enjoy when you read the book, you just get all the little details that they didn't have time to do in the film. So it's a lot of fun. Thanks so much to you both for joining me to discuss Victory City. It's been a real pleasure revisiting it with you. Before I let you go, Charlie, what are you reading now? Uh, I'm going to give that really annoying answer and say I'm reading multiple books at the moment. <laughs> the audiobook I'm listening to is called How Westminster Works and Why It Doesn't by Ian Dunt, which has a lot of stuff that is quite elementary about British politics, but also has some quite surprising insights and gives a great overall view of our political system and where it's going wrong. And the book I'm reading is, and this is a real, I'm ashamed to admit this, but I've never read Wolf Hall all the way through and I'm finally reading Wolf Hall all the way through and I'm absolutely loving it. I think that's fine. I've never read the third book, The Mirror in the Light. Nor have I. I feel very yeah. guilty about it. <laughs> now that I am surprised. <laughs> <laughs> I love the first one. I saw Hilary Mantel speak at the release date of the third one, but then the pandemic happened. I just was never in the mood. And I feel sometimes with really good things, actually, it's almost slightly nice not to finish them. Yeah. Phil, how about you? What are you reading right now? I am reading the new book I was most excited about to come out this year, which is Revolutionary Spring by Christopher Clark. This is this history of the revolutions of 1848. It is a doorstop, but he is one of my favorite historians. He's outrageously brilliant. He's the guy who wrote eight or nine years ago that book, The Sleepwalkers, about the run up to World War I and sort of how Europe fell apart at that point. This is even broader in scale. I mean, it's 900 pages. It canvasses all of Europe, and he uses every different kind of history. So statistical, going into memoirs, going into what the fiction was doing, and really going into every country and the national histories of everything. It's just absolutely breathtaking, and I'm loving it. Any listeners out there who, like me, were slightly hesitant to ask might be pleased to know that I've just Googled the revolutions of 1848 known in some countries as the springtime of the peoples or the springtime of nations, were a series of political upheavals throughout Europe starting in 1848. It remains the most widespread revolutionary wave in European history to date. Does that sound about right, Phil? Yeah, and people talked about this a lot 10 years ago with the Arab Spring because it happened in the same way where farmers saw protest in one country. Suddenly, within a week, there's protests, governments falling across the entire region. But different countries happen in different ways. Most of the places, a very conservative backlash, but you have this split between the far left radicals who would ultimately become Marxist. I mean, Das Kapital, I think, was written around this time. Then you have the liberals and you have conservatives and the impacts across the continent on all kinds of topics just from who got the vote to economics, to slavery, to imperialism to women, all of these things were impacted and there's just so much ferment in the air. It's a fascinating time. It's such a Phil book. I'm unlikely to get to it anytime soon, but I'm very happy that you're reading it. <laughs> what are you reading, Kate? What am I reading? I've also got lots of books on the go. I'm reading 
a really unexpected treat, which was recommended to me by someone I'm doing a podcast interview with next weekend. And it's called Parnassus on Wheels. You're American. Have you ever heard of this book? I don't think so, no. It's a book about books by Christopher Morley. And it's the story of a farmer and his sister who live together. It was published in 1917, but it feels like it's set a little bit earlier than that. And the farmer starts writing books. I feel in almost like a sort of folksy E.B. White, you know, that kind of beautiful writing, but delight in the homesteading and that kind of rural side of American life. And meanwhile, she's just cooking and cleaning and doing all these domestic tasks and making the whole thing run like a well-oiled machine. But she's pretty frustrated. And one day this traveling book salesman arrives with a cart that he sells his books from, like a sort of peddler, you know, he travels around from town to town. He wants to sell it and she buys it from him. And then she ends up being the person who goes off on a tour to start selling books from town to town. And it's so random, but it's so good. I'm really, really, really enjoying it. It's just great. The way it's written is great. It's a lot of fun. I don't know where it's going. Not like anything I've ever read before, but I'm really enjoying it. It's a lot of fun. Sounds great. Yeah, it is good. All right. Thank you so much for the extras. I love the extras. (laughs) See ya. See ya. That's nearly it for this episode. Books mentioned were Bordellino by Umberto Eco, Gentleman of the Road by Michael Shaban, The Princess Bride by William Goldman, How Westminster Works and Why It Doesn't by Ian Dunt, Wolf Hall by Hilary Mantel, Revolutionary Spring by Christopher Clark, and Parnassus on Wheels by Christopher Morley. This episode of the Book Club Review was edited and produced by me, Kate Slotover. Whenever you listen to this episode, if you have thoughts on it, we would love to hear them. Comment anytime on the episode page on our website, thebookclubreview.co.uk, where you'll also find full show notes, book recommendations and a transcript. Comments there go straight to our inboxes, so drop us a line. We always love to hear from you. You can also sign up for our bi-weekly-ish newsletter for extra reviews and recommendations and find out about our Patreon stream and how you can support us there. If you'd like to see what we're up to between episodes, follow us on Instagram or Facebook at Book Club Review Podcast, on Twitter at Book Club RVW Pod, or get in touch at the Book Club Review at gmail.com. And if you enjoy our shows and want to do a nice thing in return, please do leave us a quick star rating and review. Wondering how to do that? Check the show notes where you'll find a handy how-to guide. But for now, thanks for listening and happy book clubbing. <laughs>